Why try VMT? So VMT, of course, is vehicles, vehicle miles traveled. And as you all know, it, uh, there are many names for this program, uh, this type of fund uh, collection. So mileage-based user fee, road usage charge, and VMT, there's all kinds of names. And so um, ours is called Orgo, um, and we'll tell you why in a little bit. But certainly um, uh, around the US, you all have heard perhaps of the safety loo studies that were funded in, uh, 12 different cities in the U.S. I happen to have worked adjunctly on one in Seattle called Traffic Choices, which an organization much like Compass put on, Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, so there have been 12 studies doing, 12 cities doing these studies, and 12, a magic number, because that's how long Oregon has been studying this concept of a road usage charge. In fact, has put on two different pilot studies, one in 2007, one in 2012, and here we are today in 2015 with Borico. Oh, I will say Australia is also doing uh, a road usage charge currently. They're the only other one. So, uh, so Maureen, definition of road usage charge. So, our statute that enabled this last pilot was passed in 2013, and road usage charge is the language that our legislature adopted. And basically, it's a pretty easy construct. Um, you count the miles and the fuel used, and the, the reason you count the fuel used is because people get a credit on the state fuel tax that is proportionate to the gallons they use to drive the miles that are taxable. It's kind of an inelegant way to put that, but and then uh, we have account managers that collect the tax. Uh, that was one of the pieces of the legislation, and then. My, my group of people actually administers the program to make sure that all the pieces work. So our definition is <coughs> count the miles, count the fuel, offset those two things, collect the tax, and that's what we, we see in our program. Yes? And my, oh, go ahead. So or, Orgo is no longer a pilot. It's no. non-legislative, <coughs> but voluntary. It is a legislatively mandated Volunteer program. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was not a pilot, no. but <laughs> Which is why we call it a, a, a pilot. But you had two pilots before, so this is right. slightly different than your flight. Right. And in Oregon, we actually have a road user fee task force that was created by the legislature, and they were charged with coming up with a road user charge to basically take care of what was going to be deficiencies of fuel. And so they've been working on it, and under their auspices, they were, they got authority for the ODOT to go in and have such pilots. But this is the first legislatively mandated volunteer pilot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. So you're going to leave the, the gallon tax in place for now, or is yes. it just temporary until the other? Well, so we'll, we'll get into that, but the, the fuel tax remains in place because this program is only for light duty vehicles. Actually, the legislation says for vehicles with a gross vehicle weight rating less than 10,000 pounds. And then there are categories of uh, under the cap of 5,000 vehicles that can volunteer to be in the program. So we have uh, fuel tax revenue that we collect uh, that needs to pay for things that would not be an offset by this. But one thing we'll be sharing with you is that it's not double taxation. That's one of the myths of a road usage charge. So we're going to get to that. Um, that's, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so why, Maureen? What, what so, was the motivation behind it? ODEX are looking at changes in the nation's fleet. And as the fleet becomes more efficient, obviously it uses less fuel, and that has the potential to lower the fuel tax if the rate stays the same. So the last increase in Oregon was uh, in like, like 2010, 2009, is when we had our last fuel tax increase. And that did bump our revenues, but as a as with anything else, inflation has carved away in our ability to actually have the same buying power with that money. And then of course, CAFE standards being adopted by EPA, federal EPA, are expected to increase to deal with greenhouse gas emissions. And so that will increase, tend to increase the efficiency of the uh, 
light duty fleet across the country. And then um, part of that pressure is people tend to see fuel taxes being increasingly regressive as the, the newer vehicles tend to be more efficient, so people can afford new vehicles, they pay less in fuel tax. Older vehicles are less efficient, go to the secondary market, people pay more in there. So that tends to be seen as less regressive or more regressive. And then, um, as you know, federal uh, fuel tax has not increased since 1993, so the federal funds are pretty much stagnant, <coughs> and construction costs keep going up. And fuel tax, depending on whether or not you have a tax increase, may or may not be keeping that federal law. So for Oregon, we looked at 1993 and compared it to 2014. And how inflation actually was hitting our fuel tax and what we were able to buy. And so this, this first one is all about home, how it hits you in your pocketbook in home, goods you, you frequently buy, you know, bread, that kind of thing. But it also hit us in road construction materials. So you can see the difference between what we could buy in 1993, about 2,000 pounds of rebar in 1993, that same money only buys 900 pounds of rebar. So it gets a huge, huge impact. ODOT also did a study um, called Records Ahead was the publication they did on that. And they looked at the impact of poor transportation infrastructure on the economy, uh, emergency service delivery, lifetimes and getting people uh, the emergency services they needed. And it was estimated at one point that Oregon's economy can stand to lose about 100,000 jobs if roads continue to deteriorate, in part because it becomes a less um, positive environment to have businesses operate. If you have long wait times, you can't get your delivery vehicles to where they need to go and that kind of thing. So, as Colleen said, it's yeah. been kind of a long and winding road for ODOT. Right. So there have been. Yes. Um, Go ahead. I just, I guess, one that I don't quite understand is where Oregon has had the ton mile tax on big rigs so long. <coughs> why it seems to be a struggle to to make the crossover into the, the private vehicle because they already got a system mm -hmm. that is quite bigger. I'm like I was telling her when I came here, the bigger the rig is, with the more rubber on it, the more efficient it is. So it's going to be more efficient environmentally. If you got 10 axles under 106,000 pound load, it does far less damage to the road than a little five axle truck does. And it takes a lot less of them to deliver it. And uh, so their heavy vehicle, and I know I was first had trucks running in Oregon in 84. So I've been around that for a long time. And it's worked quite well. I know there's a lot of people, truckers particularly, it because it truly makes you pay your shit. If you're yes. running, you're running, you're paying. That's if the you're idea. Parking, if you're parked, you're not. And so that's why even when I had trucks running and even some of them, because of their figure configuration, was getting hit excessively hard with tax was because they had too much weight per axle on them. That's why I was getting taxed and I got rid of them. So what, what he's talking about is Oregon is one of the few states in the country that still has a weight wild tax for vehicles that weigh more than 26,000 pounds. Um, most states charge diesel tax on those vehicles and then it's shared proportionally through IFTA and through formula. So we actually took get our funds into the Highway Trust Fund from our weight wild tax, estimate the amount of diesel sold in those to, to, to contribute to the um, federal tax. Fund. But um, what we found is truckers are used to being more heavily regulated than people in passenger vehicles. And so when you go out and talk to people about, you know, stopping a way station and those kinds of things, getting an overweight permit, get <laughs> truckers get that because they're already regulated. People in a passenger vehicle, not so much. They were, they were not real keen on that. And so there's yeah. a perception. Even though in Oregon we do have a constitutional provision that requires all vehicles to pay their commensurate share, and that's um, 
highway cost allocation study is actually done every two years in, to report the legislature. And it looks at the amount of revenue that you know, is collected from different vehicle classes and whether or not the fees they pay is proportionate with their use of the highways. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, too, about how we're, we as drivers, uh, the non-commercial drivers, we're just used to go, we put the gas in our car, and we go. We don't even realize that the gas tax is, well, she does, but uh, <laughs> most of us don't even realize that the gas tax is built into the price. You know, it's just so easy. I just go fill up and go. So um, this is all about being a little bit more informed about your driving, just like the truckers currently are. Um, so where we got... Uh, how we got to here, though, is um, these two pilot studies that we talked to you about. We learned a lot from these things, and this is how we got to the program that we had today, Orego. So from the first road user fee pilot, we did um, we had people reporting their mileage at the pump and uh, found that we wanted to move to a more electronic system. That was too much to ask the drivers. Um, it was, you know, your own record keeping, too much for the people who were doing the record keeping. Actually, people that participated in that first pilot had to install a fairly large black box <laughs> in their car, Not and good. they had to fuel at certain stations to get the credit applied on their, so they would charge them a mileage fee, and then it would reduce the, by the fuel tax, and then it would offset, and they pay the difference. If they didn't fuel at one of the two stations that were in that pilot, then they had to send us paper. And so, in my fuel tax, you know, we would write refund checks. We would process refund checks for very small amounts of money to get people back their fuel tax. So there has so, to be a better way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so we went to a more wireless approach. Another thing we learned from the second pilot study was that, um, you know, there's a perfect story that Jim Witte always tells about, um, you know, he would say sometimes, or people in the audience would say, well, um, What's wrong with uh, having the GPS in the, in, uh, or no, I don't want to have the GPS in the vehicle. Um, and someone would say, well, why not? Uh, you, you carry your phone around with you all the time. Why wouldn't you mind that uh, there's GPS tied with your car? And people said, well, you know what the difference is? I choose to have my cell phone, and I choose to turn the GPS on if I want, I, or, or use that type of a smartphone. I, I would not be happy if you, know, you mandated a GPS system. And so um, we designed Origo to be something where um, you would have a choice. So you could choose a GPS system through a private account manager, or you could choose a non-GPS version through the state government uh, feature. And that's because partly, you know, people didn't want the idea of the government, you know, uh, using the GPS tracking so we don't believe it we're not we don't aren't tracking where people are going we're measuring the miles it's a user fee so we measure what people are using yes why I mean uh, cars are all in the computer world now you're right why can't we don't need to know where they went exactly. all we need to know is the total miles Precisely. I know when I fill out my quarterly report for the highway user for my weights I just fill out a paper and it shows how many miles I drove in Oregon. It doesn't, right. it doesn't say whether I went. The only time right. I ever have to show where I went is if I ever get audited. Then I have to have books at home. Right. It, and my bill of lading track where I picked the load up and where it went. In, in the commercial side. That's right. And, but uh, in the private sector, your cars. The vehicles. Is, 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 you can plug into the car and tell how many miles it's went without no, you're right. invading, invading anybody's privacy as to where they went or how they got there. And many people believe that's where we will be, you know, and it, eventually. It's sort of a step if you, I, I've been wanting to create a graphic because it, it really is a mileage based user fee, um, road usage charge concept, you know, sort of a step to a connected vehicle, autonomous vehicle, you know, it's it's getting it's getting more high tech with the vehicles. So uh, who knows where that will all go? I mean, people like Google and, and others know where that will be headed. Um, but uh, this is definitely sort of a step in that direction. So there are a couple of things that we looked at along the way. Um, one thing is uh, Oregon actually studied charging everyone a flat annual fee to drive, and um, especially. They were going to especially 
and actually enacted a, a law that charged it for uh, electric vehicles, and it was widely, very, very unpopular, and it was repealed shortly thereafter. And it really, this flat enough fee really misses the point of uh, paying for your usage of infrastructure based on actual usage. Flat fee actually sort of is unfair to the person who doesn't drive very much. Let's say I pay $150 and I drive my vehicle 7,000 miles a year, but someone who say vehicle drives 35,000 miles, they have much more uh, wear and tear on infrastructure than they have. So and we know that some states. Didn't go and we know that some states, um, including Idaho, are enacting uh, fees on uh, high mileage vehicles, hybrids, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later and kind of how that fits with everything. Um, and I think that's also an evolving process as we go. Um, so another thing we looked at was taxing your electricity, so uh, for your vehicles. And the thing about that is that um, you know it's hard to differentiate. The electricity that you're putting into your car versus the electricity that's fueling your home and so that wasn't an option that worked either but we did look into it even taxing tires but you know how, how often do you really change your tires not that often tires wear out at different rates so again that was not really a viable option either along the way we looked at taxing your battery for your car same thing they last forever and uh, you weren't going to really get uh, substantial revenue from that. Many states are doing tolls, and we could toll our interstate highways, but we needed a way to sustainably fund uh, transportation and roads, city roads, county roads, state roads, all of them, not just the highway toll, just the highways. And the highway tolls tend to stay in the corridor that, that they are told in, so that didn't really make sense for the whole state. So, Idaho just raised your fuel tax, so uh, hats off to you. That's a difficult decision to make, and um, you did it, and uh, that's great. And in fact, uh, at this juncture in time, sometimes it's not the best, the optimum time to be talking about a road usage charge when you were just out with the public and um, got their support to raise the, the gas tax. So now you would be talking about an alternative to that gas tax. So it's kind of a, a hard moment to talk about it. However, now is the time um, to talk about, uh, to kind of set the table for that. Because as we know, even though we raised the gas tax in Idaho and Washington and about nine other states in the country, it still doesn't fill the gap. And it also is not a sustainable funding measure that, you know, we see the declining revenues from gas tax. Um, we just talked about it, the Prius, the, the EV, the hybrid vehicles are not bringing, uh, are causing the revenue kind of to go down and people are driving less. And so this is what we're faced with. Um, so we did talk about raising the fuel taxes and Oregon chose not to do. So myth busters, uh, we talked a little bit about that, some of the myths that we face. One of the things is that this is unfair. Unfair to low income uh, people, unfair to rural drivers, um, that road use to charge would be unfair. And, and uh, we're gonna bust some of those myths as we go on. Um, another one is that it's an invasion of privacy, people felt, like we talked about earlier. You're gonna, the government's gonna be tracking you. Well, as we just talked about, that's really not true. Uh, we're not tracking you, we just want to measure the miles and your usage and have you pay for that. Uh, there is a myth that it's complicated and costly to operate. Um, it really functions um, on a economies of scale. You know, there are some magic numbers that you can get to. Um, Five million participants, I think, is uh, where you get to on your economic models. So I, I <coughs> don't get into economic modeling because it's way too complicated. But set, okay. setting up um, a program, there's some costs that you, you pay at the front end, and then the, you can amortize them over the life of the program. And then there's some costs that may scale depending on you know what people can make the program. And that's a, some analysis that we we're just now getting ready to start doing. Um, now that we've gone live with the program. So 
Right. We're not done yet. We do know there are economies of scale, but we, we're not really sure what they are. So thank you. That's all. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we don't know all the answers, but we know uh, double taxation is something we hear a lot. Like, so you're going to charge me the gas tax and the road usage charge. Well, um, ideally, a road usage charge could replace the gas tax. Uh, Maureen will explain it doesn't 100% uh, replace it, but you're not going to be paying both. You're not going to pay the same state gas tax and also a road usage charge. It, this is meant to replace that. And then finally, uh, the deterrent to purchase the hybrid vehicles. Um, people say, oh gosh, you know, if, if this is going to cost me more in my hybrid vehicle, why would I bother buying one? Didn't you want me to be environmental? And we say, well, gosh, you are saving a ton. And Maureen has a great slide on this. You're saving a ton already in your gas prices. We're just going to skim a little bit off that so that you can pay your fair share. So in 2013, <clears throat> ODOT actually commissioned a study looking at rural driver patterns versus urban driver patterns. And what we found is that generally rural drivers took fewer trips, but they were longer trips. Urban drivers do a lot of short trips frequently. It's, you know, I'm sitting home, I need ice cream, I go to the store, it's you know, half a mile away, um, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> on average, there wasn't really a big, significant difference between urban and rural driving on an annualized basis. It was pretty comparable. And then there's always this thing about fuel-efficient vehicles. Um, like I said, Oregon has a constitutional requirement that there's a uh, that everyone pays their fair share, essentially. You know, under the user pays principal cost allocation study uh, phenomenon. And fuel-efficient vehicles are already avoiding the cost of fuel, and they're in my comments, and there's a slide later which sort of shows, I, I pulled Idaho's fuel values, so you can look at that. And then, like she said there, that the amount of tax on a per mile basis, in our state was set based on our fuel tax rate and the average fleet. So that's how we got to one and a half cents. Um, we have 30 cent you know, fuel tax for state, and the average fleet at the time the bill passed, uh, the average vehicle in the fleet got 20 miles a gallon. So they just did the math and said, okay, on average one, most of the people to pay the same if they're in the program. So. <coughs> so what we found was that the per mile user fee is the fairest way. And that little device up there in the corner, the little green device, that's the, the, the thing that does the match. That goes in the OED onboard diagnostic port, OED 2 port, if you will, on your vehicle, and it actually can measure your fuel consumption most of the time, and it can measure uh, your mileage, and it uses cell technology to transmit that to the town manager. So <coughs> it's a one-way communication stream, which is so they're fairly secure. And so what we like to say here also is that um, that little device is very similar to what Maureen is wearing on her wrist, and how many else of you are wearing a Fitbit? or a Nike fuel band, or, you know, we're, we're getting into monitoring our own behavior. Uh, we want to know if we can hit the 10,000 step mark. We want to know how many miles we're riding our bike. We want to know, we have a Weight Watcher app because we want to <coughs> make sure we're not exceeding our calories for the day. Um, some of us. Some of us. <laughs> I know. Right. So, uh, you know. so this is a way, and uh, much like your utility, statement shows you how many do you get the utility bill that says, hey, Colleen, here's your uh, fee for this month, and here's where you average compared to your neighbors. And so it's it's making you an, a more informed driver about your own behavior, how much gas you're using, and even pointing out to you, gee, do you even know how much gas tax you're paying, or that you even have that little port in your car that we all have if you have a vehicle after you have a gasoline-powered vehicle and it's manufactured after 1996, you have a standardized port um, that that device goes into. And if you have a diesel vehicle manufactured after 2004, the port is standardized to report diesel as well. Here's the favorite one. I love this. Marie. So this is based on Idaho's uh, fuel cost. At the time I did the slide, I put in Idaho and pulled up fuel 
which is substantially less than what we're paying the organ, by the way. I just think I should point that out. <laughs> and then it also looked at electricity. And, and the, so it's the electric e gallon equivalent to what it would cost to fuel a vehicle. So it's kind of interesting because people, <coughs> if they look at their cost of fueling, uh, the fuel cost for a gasoline powered vehicle actually includes your federal and state taxes. For the electric vehicle, it probably includes some kind of utility tax, but none of that goes to transportation infrastructure, in, at least not in Oregon. So if you found some way to have your utility commission take some of that money and send it to transportation, that's great, but it doesn't happen in our state. So, so the $2.73 includes the gas tax, right. and the $0.95 cent electric uh, E, what do they call it? E-gallon equivalent. E-gallon equivalent gallon. Does not cost. include a tax, and we don't know the precise amount, but you put a, you put a little bit on there to, as your mileage right. fee. And you see, that's what I was trying to demonstrate before, is it's still probably going to put you just barely over a dollar or so. So you're still paying quite a bit less with the more fuel-efficient vehicles. You're just paying a little bit more of your share. Mm -hmm. Yes, Senator. What, what is that, the device called that? in new vehicles? Um, we, ca we call it a mileage reporting device, and it's fondly called um, a dongle. A lot of people call it a dongle. It's, you know, it's what uh, people use for patient drive insurance programs, those kind of things. So they're, they're fairly common, actually. Yes? Can you also, what the, the port in your car is called as well? Onboard diagnostic port. Um, they became standardized in 1996. There, some cars before that had an OBD2 port or an onboard diagnostic port, but one, one, one right. Mm -hmm. And then in 96, they standardized uh, based on UPA standards, and so that became OBD2, and they're working on OBD3, but that's still not widely done. Most of, the, of us in the communications business will say, I would say that down the road, we probably should come up with some more uh, more easily remembered names. And calling, like I said, too much information. Yeah. Like, nobody needs to know Obi, Obi Wan Kenobi. Or, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and how does it work? So, here's the bill. So, Senate Bill 810 was our uh, legislation that passed in the 2013 session. Our project actually started um, in July of 2014 to implement it. And we had a go live date mandated in the legislation of July 1st, 2015, which we did. So they set the rate, the legislature set the rate of one and a half cents per gallon based on you know, the average fuel efficiency of a vehicle and the three cent gas tax. And they mandated that people get a fuel tax credit for the fuel used to drive the miles that were taxable. Um, we had to provide choices, so we have three account managers signed up providing different options. We had to offer an option that was not GPS enabled, so two of the account managers offered GPS enabled devices, one does not. We had to have an open system that would allow for other choices so we could bring in new technologies. For example, most new vehicles have onboard telematics as part of the original equipment manufacturers. Uh, package and if an account manager wanted to come to us and say we want to use telematics to track this information or to capture this information and share it, our system would allow for that. <coughs> um, the bill also told us that we need to have private sector administration options so we have three. There are penalties for fraud although it's interesting because it's a volunteer program so you know like what we pretty much kick them out of the program. And <clears throat> they required us to have protection for personally identifiable information. So our agency does not get any trip information. We get aggregated miles from the account managers. We don't know where people drive. And it's really interesting because I go out and talk to people in, who are in the program and they'll say, look, I can see where I drove and they'll show me their account with their, you know, their I want to see it. And I'm like, okay, well, you get that information because you have a relationship with the account manager. I don't get that information. All I get are the aggregated miles for all of the trips that you took. So it's it's, it's interesting. Why do we call it Oregon? 
Uh, we did uh, extensive discussion with people around the state, uh, focus groups. Uh, we wanted to have Orgo be something that the people of Oregon would feel proud about, as proud as you can be about a tax program. But uh, we heard from people that uh, we want roads to be there when we need them. We want to be able to drive the open roads uh, in the beautiful country that is Oregon. And so uh, one woman said, I picture it, I picture driving Oregon as my dog with its head out the window and the wind blowing through its <laughs> you know, uh, fur. And so uh, we worked um, long and hard with people to come up with something that would <coughs> resonate and kind of represent what transportation means to people in Oregon. And I bring this up because when you, as a state or a DOT, are introducing a program like this, it's different than a road closure at a major interchange. Um, it's, it's more like a product. And so hence it has a brand. And we identified that brand as kind of, you know, Oregon can be a little quirky. Um, we're pioneers. We like to be the first to try things. And so I always say, uh, when the road gets bumpy, stay true to your brand. Because if you, you know, we all know government programs. I can think of one in another state where, um, you know, the toll felt a little high and they came in and changed it really, really quick and took it down lower because they were nervous about how high it was or, um, you know, nervous about talking about transportation in a quirky, pioneering product-oriented sort of way to appeal to your customers, and then going back to the bureaucratic kind of way of talking. Um, I say stay true to the brand. Don't be afraid to say that this is the fairest way to pay for transportation. Go out there and sell this product because um, that's, that's what you're doing. You're, you're really um, talking to your customers and, and sharing um, the features and benefits, most importantly, the benefits of the program. And for so us, many yes. technical questions. Please. What is the E lowercase? <laughs> uh, we didn't want it to be ego. Oh, okay. <laughs> we oh. took the ego out of Oregon. <laughs> and it's supposed to be like Oregon. Yeah. Nope. Okay. And it kind of has that E, you know how the E find, you know, electronic like email and, you know, sort of. So it, it worked. Go is kind of moving forward in Oregon. And we had a lot of other kind of um, more catchy names that didn't really mean something, but this is what meant something to the people of Oregon. Good question. And, and the thing I think that is interesting about Oregon you know, pioneering this yeah. is we were the first state to have a gas tax. <laughs> so 1919, we passed a gas tax in Oregon, and here we are now pioneering yet another tax, which no doubt will endear us to everyone. Right? <laughs> um, so this is kind of that open system we talked about. So <clears throat> the vehicle has a device in it that, that, like I said, captures mileage data, fuel data, and it transmits it to account managers. Now we have an ODOT account manager, that's the non-GPS enabled device, and then we have two commercial account managers. They are responsible for setting up the accounts for people sending the mileage reporting device to the people and making sure that they know how to install it in their vehicle. And so they're doing that piece of this open system. And those people could arguably come and go out of our tax system at any time. And then ODOT makes sure that the vehicles are eligible because there's a eligibility requirement, no vehicle with a gross vehicle weight rating in excess of 10,000 pounds can participate. For example, the vehicle has to be registered in Oregon, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we're handling those things, and then we're communicating with the account managers. We are not communicating directly with the vehicles. And like I said, we have these account managers. So our ODOT account manager must accept any volunteer that is otherwise eligible for the program. And they don't provide any other value added services. Um, commercial account managers can pick and choose. For example, Verizon Telematics is one of our account managers. They have a contract with uh, State Farm Insurance. So they already have the in-drive device in those vehicles because people are signed up with the insurance program. So they're offering services there. And Azug is the third account manager that's a commercial account manager. And their, their <coughs> core market is really fleets. Um, so they're actually 
offering a lot of extra services like geofencing. You can uh, you earn badges as you drive, so it's basically a gamification of your driving patterns. So people that drive less than a, a mile in any one trip, you get a badge that says could have walked. You know, if you're out late, you get a pumpkin <laughs> badge or something. I, I'm not in that program. I'm, into a pumpkin. I'm in the basic, you know. Oh, that one. But the people are checking that days. every day. We're yes. hearing that, you know, they'll check their wallet, they'll check their score, right. they're having competitions against each other. So people are into that. Uh, so know. this is actually um, our homepage or on our website. So people can go and then pick their account manager based on uh, the information provided. So GPS or not, prepay or not. So this is the experience <coughs> that people have when they enter the program. They, select their account manager, they sign up, <coughs> they get this little device and that comes with instructions about how to install it. It's activated. Uh, basically when it's put in the car, it sends a signal via cell technology to the account manager so they know it's in the car. And that triggers it and then, then you drive. And of course, we expect you to pay. So there's that whole payment thing. <coughs> Yes. Yes. Do you have auto-emission testing in Oregon? Yes. So do they have to unplug that, plug in the... They do now, although our uh, Department of Environmental Quality is contracting with one of our account managers to provide those services because they can read the emissions test through this device. So that will be another value-added service that they potentially will offer. Making things more easy, streamlined, I, I love it. So. It's interesting because Azuka actually has you set up a wallet when you sign up for an account. So you put money in a wallet and it reconciles on a daily basis when you drive and get that credit. Um, State Farm appends it to your, or Verizon Telematics appends it to the bill that you get for uh, your insurance. And then Set App actually just shows you your account and you can request an invoice or your pays when you get to certain threshold. So where are we? We're two and a half months just about into this. So here's kind of what we've accomplished so far. We signed contracts with the three account managers, private sector account managers in November of 2014. Uh, we built a system uh, that is custom built by ODOT staff to actually do that interface between our, our DMV and the three account managers and our financial system in ODOT. Um, we certified three firms and basically what that meant is we had have, we have them, uh, we tested them to see if they were meeting our business needs. So they had to uh, process payments using payment card industry data security standards, for example. They had to show that their device had security that uh, and was manufactured in SAE standards. So there are a whole bunch of things that we were concerned about privacy and data security and these kinds of things. So that's what certification was all about. And as of the 21st, we had 900 uh, vehicles that were enrolled. And I don't say volunteers because some people enroll multiple vehicles. And as you can see, most of the vehicles enrolled are in the more efficient categories. So we Why have is that? <coughs> we have caps. So the bill said that we could have up to 1,500 people in the category of uh, 17 miles per gallon below. We could have 1,500, up to 1,500 people enrolled in the uh, category of efficiency between 17 and 22 miles per gallon, and then, you know, potentially we could have all of the volunteers come from 22 and above, as long as we didn't cap out any particular threshold. So it's interesting that the largest number of people that have enrolled have really very efficient vehicles. Do you have any thoughts on why that might be? <coughs> do any of you drive hybrid vehicles? Um, well, you do. <laughs> I know that. And uh, why do you drive the hybrid vehicle? So many yes, guess, my that's one of the reasons. Was that your primary reason for investing in a Prius? Mostly they have a long commute, so good gas mileage. Yeah. And so that's like money, and, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, talk to a lot of uh, hybrid vehicle owners and even EV vehicle owners, and 
many times it's their first answer isn't to save money, or it's, I might say it's not their only answer. Uh, they are first adopters. They want to do the right thing environmentally. So here they want to do the right thing by paying their fair share. Um, we're finding that people who are early adopter types who get into gamification, who want to get the latest you know, high uh, mileage vehicle are, are interested in this. Um, and so we see it reflected in how many people are signed up from that category. So again, we're not done yet. We've got some next steps. We are not. Actually, um, October 20th is when the first tax reports will come in from our account managers. The two commercial account managers actually will pay on all taxable miles driven, whether or not they've been paid for them. And the ODOT account manager pays just like as if it were standing in the shoes of ODOT. So it will pay us for miles for which it's been paid. So I've made two payments to <coughs> the ODOT account manager for a total of $1.56. Um, so we know that we're at least going to have a dollar fifty-six in revenue, you know, showing up on that yeah. report from the one account manager. We also require our account managers to send us what we call errors and events reports every week, and that could be uh, misfires with the mileage reporting devices or you know changes in their systems as they fine-tune them, that kind of thing. So we, we get those every week and look at those. They're required to give us key performance indicator reports, which looks at customer service, because as Colin said, we want to make sure that people have a really good customer experience when they go through this program as volunteers. So that is wait times, response times to emails, all those kinds of things. That's what we look at. Yes? Got some missing up here. Um, when you're charging them that penny and a half yes. a mile, yes. and then giving them credit for the fuel tax they paid, uh, theoretically at this point, so they're not being, are they, are, is the goal that they're actually, the ones participating are gonna be paying more? The ones that have a very efficient vehicle that get more than 20 miles a gallon, actually won't be more. But those are the, uh, category who are have the gas guzzler vehicles um, end up paying a little less, but they're paying more in fuel costs. I mean, well, they're paying, buying more gallons of gas, so you know what I mean. So it kind of even out. So, so they'll 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 still be charged the penny and the half right. for miles they travel. Yes. And then uh, the fuel, so they burned a lot more fuel. <coughs> Still have a lot more credit coming. Right. Yes. And what happens at the end of the year? Um, when their their credit amount gets to a certain threshold, they actually will get a check. <coughs> uh, credit. Uh, no, they'll get a, they get a check. A check. Oh, right. right. Yeah. So we cash out their credit. Yeah. So they okay. Zero. And if they leave the program um, and they have a credit, we we <coughs> offer them a check. We've had a couple people leave the program, although we have a 97% retention rate at this point. We've had a couple people leave the program because they want to do page drive insurance through a company that isn't part of our program. And um, the amounts that we would owe them are like less than a dollar. So we contact them and say, do you want us to process a check? Because we, we have to if they want it. Most of them say, nah, I don't care. Thank you, I, I enjoyed the experience. And, and so we, we document that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what happens once you get to the 4,500 uh, people who are signed up? Just yeah, 5,000 is the cap. 5,000, mm -hmm. so the legislature kick back in? Um, something, what happens there? It's interesting because the legislation actually does not have a sunset on it. So we're running this as long as they tell us to, or you know, so we'll just see how it goes. So Marie, we have uh, one of the deliverables on the project is a report to the, the road user fee task force that will talk about what lessons we've learned. So Didn't we have, we talked about though, um, 
if we got to 5,000 and more people wanted to participate? We have a wait list yeah. process, so we can wait list people. Okay, yeah. Um, yes, sir. I, I wonder why they put a limit on it if they're wanting this to replace the gas tax in the long run. I think they just had to create a program. Um, but I think that it will be revisited. If it's just going so splendidly, it could expand. It's up to the legislature. Right. It, was, it was to build the infrastructure. To, to yeah. Going. So that's, that kind of is an interesting bouncing off point to the next step in marketing and recruiting volunteers. So um, as we said, we've got a 5,000 cap. We've got close to 1,000 people. We could certainly have more. And there's, um, you know, uh, there's more we can do to expose people to the program and, and you know it's not like you're it's not second nature to just go home and say i'm gonna hurry home and sign up for that new tax program it, it takes a lot of kind of education and understanding of like oh gee i didn't know i might actually be saving money or i might be able to learn more about my driving behavior i'm kind of interested in that and so as you can imagine we're approaching um some of the larger employers that might someone like an Intel that might have first adopter types who are working at that company. Um, Columbia in Oregon who has people who love the great outdoors and exploring and driving around. Nike who, just try it, you know? <laughs> so uh, we're gonna be talking to large employers. It's our next phase of outreach and marketing. And then uh, we'll also do a digital marketing campaign that kind of, um, is directed exactly at the demographic that we know is interested in, in the program. But for now we have a thousand and, and we have an opportunity to show outstanding customer service and those customers almost become our ambassadors to say, hey, this is really working. So, um, like I said, we have a 97% retention rate so far. As people leave the program, we actually do an exit survey with them to see why they left, what did they like, what worked, what didn't, that kind of thing because we want their feedback. That's really a key critical component for us. And then we also, in our road usage charge administrative system, which we finally call RECUS, we log issues and inquiries so we can track our timeliness and responding to those. And some of the feedback we get is really, really fun. We have people that said, I really want this to succeed. I want this to happen. And, and that's really interesting for people to write in and sort of volunteer that from the heart mm -hmm. that they are interested in seeing this. Is, yes. is there any difference in your statistics so far? You don't have a big enough sampling, I wouldn't think, but uh, between like the Portland and, and uh, Western mm -hmm. uh, Oregon versus Eastern Oregon. We actually um, take the data that comes out of our RECA system and uh, have it on a dashboard. And we, so we can show where the people are enrolled. And it's probably not a surprise that the eastern side of the state, all the way from Portland and down to Ashland, are the primary participants. But that's where the bulk of the, the population is charged as well. And then we have a pocket up you know, here in um, kind of the Baker to Ontario area where people sign up. So we, we'll, we'll show you what that looks like. So in tomorrow's session, are you going to go into more detail yeah. about how you do the attribution and balance out the accounts? Is that going to be tomorrow? Because I'll be coming tomorrow. I want to see how, yeah. how that plays out. Is, is, <coughs> is there a possibility that you end up getting less revenue than you had? I mean, you've only got a small sample, but... Yeah. This was not intended to actually bring in any real revenue. This is revenue neutral, I think. So one of the things that we anticipate the legislature will want to look at, at and certainly our road users will be task forces in this, this is to make this a mandatory program or to make it a really viable, sustainable program, what would need to change? And that depends on if you want to bring in all vehicles or if you want to bring in certain vehicles because <clears throat> obviously electronic methods for reporting are really easy if you can make those happen. And we know that those can be driven by the market. For example, uh, onboard telematics might be something that we can evaluate in the future, assuming that car auto manufacturers were interested in allowing us to use that data. 
Um, we do know that people, yes? You, you raised an interesting point. It's been a while since I bought a car <laughs> for my own self. But, uh, the outfit I'm working for is taking delivery on a couple of pieces of heavy construction equipment. Mm -hmm. And basically, whether we want it or not, we're getting a service from the manufacturer that tracks the hours used <coughs> by operating. They give us reports, they send us an email when it's time for filter chain, when it's time for auto chain. Basically, the excavator talks to the company through the vendor, and the vendor knows what their machinery is doing. We as employers know what our machinery as well as our employees are doing. And I, it, I, again, I don't know how that's working in the auto market, but I have to believe that some of the more higher end vehicles already have this. And it's just a question of yeah. have those auto manufacturers or even equipment or truck manufacturers reached out to you to talk about your program to see if that's scalable um, for them? They have not. The account managers are interested in getting that data and we know of a couple of data aggregators that have agreements with auto manufacturers to ca capture that data. Right. So if they wanted to provide that to the account manager to provide it to us, that would potentially be a way we could get that information. We did have um, one of our Paving contractors in Oregon sign up some of their light duty vehicles because they wanted to see, get the kind of information you're talking about in their light duty. Well, but nationally, the they're, we at the right. they're, the the they're at the table. The auto manufacturers are at the table. We just know what it's doing while yeah. it's doing it. Right. And we can use that as a management tool or a diagnostic. Right. But it has all the same stuff. If you were to want to tax my excavator, it knows how many gallons of diesel went through it. Absolutely. They have been involved uh, okay. in the um, discussions, and I know I've sat in on some of the meetings in California, and there's definitely someone representing the auto manufacturers sitting at the table on a national level as this program, you know, sort of develops um, on a, a larger scale, for sure. Yeah. I know, because uh, I'm the same outfit they did. Uh -huh. been there a lot longer. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, those have been really useful. Uh, we, we started finding out what vehicles have been left idling. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We didn't need right. to be. Yeah. Um, Using up gas while they're sitting there. Is that amazing? Yeah, and, think about that. and the other <coughs> one that's done for us is in the past, uh, one of the other highway districts really came in for them is they got a, a phone call. Hey, you got a loader out there that's got something going wrong with it because the computer's telling them there's too many particles in the oil. And they sent the thing into the factory and it was covered under warranty. It was an internal engine failure. It was long before it was gonna, before it did any permanent damage to the engine, but it actually picked up that there was metal particles showing up in the engine oil. We want this sent, information. Sent, sent, and so yeah, I, I guess from, being the truck owner of the trucking company and being the commissioner of that highway district, being able to track where things are while well, in the trucking industry now. I, I can remember 30 years ago going into truck stops and there'd be a wall there as big as that one with pictures of truckers and equipment that had just driven off the face of the earth. Yeah. And now that the trucks are tracked, yeah. a company can find those trucks instead of, you know, when somebody hijacks it, they have an idea where to go look for it, so hopefully find the driver before something happens. Yeah, so. knowledge is power, as they say. We, we, did, we have learned that um, incentives can influence people's behavior. For example, the account managers that allow for gamification and people to yeah. track their trips and to, to geofence so they know where um, people should and should not be, be for that can influence people into opting into the program. Uh, calling touch on this earlier with people may be uncomfortable. Kids, right? You can track you your can kids, you can do that. One of our account managers has his device set up so when he leaves work, his wife gets notice that he's left so she knows about how much time you know, it takes him to commute home so she can have dinner ready. Oh. That's, that's their arrangement. I, you know, nice. um, other people have set yeah. up where they they have told their parents you can drive in this area because they want to make sure that their parent is in a safe zone, if you will. So they put a geofence around it and 
where they think their parent or their child should be. Can do what so as much people as you do want. really interesting things yeah. with these devices. We know that um, people don't necessarily want government making those choices for them, however. And you know, we need to figure out what what's the right reporting frequency to make sure that you have that sustainable revenue coming in. And then you know, government has to figure out do they want an open system or a closed system? Do they want to run the whole thing or do they want to have account managers? And then, of course, when all else fails, you probably need some kind of backup system. Is that paper? What is that? Mm -hmm. So those are things that we, you know, we probably need to address. <coughs> we suspect in 2017 that the legislature will probably look at this program if not before. And, and there may be some decisions made around the policy choices of which vehicles, when, what race structure, you know, what's impact in terms of fuel tax collections, et cetera, et cetera. So those are all choices. I, to me, it looks like an easy one. Uh, from the other side, it helps people to understand they're paying one and a half cent now. Yeah. You know, a quarter of a cent boost would not be that much when the individual looks at it. But it would be a massive amount of money yeah. statewide. State. Yeah. And it'd be a lot more palatable. And it would take a 20 cent gas tax increase to generate yeah. the kind of money that a quarter of a cent. One of the things that's interesting in fuel and tax administration is um, you're familiar <coughs> with weight mile tax in, in Morgan. The, the administrative cost to administer that program are significantly higher than fuel tax because in fuel tax you get large sums of money from very few people. So mm -hmm. your auditing and your enforcement mechanisms of those are pretty small. But if you're going out and touching lots of, like in Oregon it'd be three million vehicles potentially, to make sure that they're reporting appropriately, the, the percent of that revenue that you spend on administrative costs would probably be significantly higher just because of the, you know, you've got that touch point. But with more people participating, then it goes down. So, and you know, so, when you get to that magic number of people participating, you can have that on a if if your if your uh, vendors are a common, you can have that magic number. I say five. It's been thrown around five million. It's uh, it could be Oregon, California, Washington together making up that five million potentially. Right? No. So working with other states. Yes. Go ahead. So we've got the, um, oh, I think it's a new app, it's new to me. Um, I get in the car, my phone won't let me text because yes. I signed up for that. Awesome. So is there some type of a app that could work with cell phones or was there a reason why you didn't go with cell we looked at kind of technology? Or? Um, we did look at it, mm -hmm. but no account manager actually proposed that. So the system we design, designed as our administration system actually is technology agnostic. So if someone wanted to use telematics, we'd make them go through a certification process to make sure that what they reported was relatively accurate and met all our business needs. Same with <coughs> cell technology, any of those technologies. Our system is agnostic. So these are the states that are at the table. That doesn't mean that they are developing programs necessarily. Oops, there you go. Uh, maybe it just is on the time. Uh, so you see Idaho. So um, we have someone at the table from Idaho, and it's good because we're uh, everyone's learning from each other. This is definitely on a timer. <laughs> Anyhow, um, yeah. And so you know that Oregon and California are actively doing some work. Other states are considering it. Um, there are RFPs out from the Western Road Usage Charge Consortium for things like a calculator so that each state can put in their own numbers and people can see what would I pay in road usage charge versus what would I pay on, um, with a gas tax individually, people can put it in. Uh, rural versus urban, kind of on a broader scale. Um, and then cross state travel, so that's a big deal here in Idaho. So there will be a whole study launched on that particular topic. So what does it mean if I live in Idaho but I work over in Ontario or vice versa? So those things are happening and we're working together. Yes? 
Can you address how Oregon's program handles that now? Well, they're very accurate in terms of being able to, to know where the state line is. Mm -hmm. And we found that out because we did operational trial of 30 vehicles before we went live. And we had people get in vehicles and drive circuitous routes throughout the state of Oregon and into Washington and into California and into Idaho. And those devices are very, very accurate based on the cell technology of being able to uh, locate the, uh, those vehicles. So <clears throat> it's, they're very accurate. And as long as they can track the fuel attributable to it, then they're good to go. Just out of curiosity, you raise an interesting issue because I know mm -hmm. in some of our capital for a day in Idaho, we talk about how because of the sales tax issue with our neighbor in Oregon, yeah. A lot of people go across the border and, and purchase things that they yes. wouldn't otherwise purchase because there's a differential between how the states administer your tax program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This doesn't necessarily hurt that or even help that problem. This is kind of neutral there, but mm -hmm. potentially, again, with a consortium, you would be, I guess, discouraging that. It, there have been lots of very really interesting questions. We've gotten questions from people about, well, I fueled my vehicle in, say, Idaho. <clears throat> you probably wouldn't do it now that your fuel tax is higher than ours, but they used to fuel here and then drive into Oregon, and we would give them a 30 cent uh, you know, fuel tax credit based on the miles that they drove in Oregon. Right. Well, we don't have a way of knowing where they bought the fuel and what fuel tax would be paid on the state side. Unless more and more states are doing this. Right. Yeah. Um, and even then, you probably wouldn't want to necessarily track where the fuel was sold. You might want to figure out some kind of sharing like they do at the, um, with IFTA through for trucks or you know some other model for doing that so you don't have to track fuel purchases exactly. But that's another one of those things that is to be determined. Yes? Well, like you said, the IFTA, we had a quarterly report. Yeah. Miles traveled to the state. <laughs> uh, you said it's very accurate on the state line. Um, the, the goal for this you know, right now you keep talking about the credit they get for paying the tax. The long-term goal that for me to see this to really be worth the time of day is that the gas tax, the fuel tax goes away. And like you said, if you've got multiple states, their fuel tax all goes away. Potentially, yeah. And, and when I cross the state line, maybe Idaho's charging me two cents. Maybe Oregon's a cent and a half, maybe California's three cents, but I will pay for the miles I drive in their state. And we'd be interoperable. And, and, and it has no nothing bearing on the other states. It's when I cross that line, yeah. my unit says you're in California, and, and California sends you a bill, right. and, and I know trucking industry is almost yeah. there already. So. I heard someone describe it at a conference uh, earlier this week, and he said, you know, that over time, he said that uh, cars were the most kind of wasted uh, possession you have in a way, because he says you drive it by yourself a lot of times, you got all these empty seats, you get to your destination, and it just sits there all day, and then you get back in, and you take the three seats, and you go home, and he was kind of going on this road, and, and then he said, well, you know, like, so pretty soon, maybe people, not that soon, would be uh, going to car to go. They go down the bottom of the hill, they walk down there, they get in their car to go. You've seen those car to go things. Get in, you swipe your card, you drive it to your destination, you leave it there, you go to work. And so it's measuring the miles. That you're, you're, all you're paying for is what you used in that vehicle. I thought, oh my gosh, he's right. That's the next kind of, you know, we may not all get to that point, but pretty soon it may be more efficient to use the roads in that way. Kind of bicycle shares. And yeah, like that. You pay for what you use on the bike. You don't have to have your own bike. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. Thoughts? So, so any other questions? Essentially, what we're doing with this program is we're, we're changing the paradigm on how we take transportation. You know, we still have uh, weight mile tax for heavy trucks. We have uh, DMV fees that pay for registration, those kinds of things. And then we have fuel tax. So we have kind of a three-legged stool for paying for transportation in Oregon. And it's very similar to most states. That's not a surprise to any of you. But we're asking people to think about paying for transportation as if it were a utility. So you pay your 
your licensure fee for your vehicle and your driver's license have access to the infrastructure. And then you pay by the mile for actually using it. And that's really kind of the paradigm shift that we're looking at. Well, to me, uh, it's like with Oregon, and with a ton mile tax. Yeah. Oregon's base plate is four hundred dollars <throat> to buy a plate for a big truck, and it is prorated. If you're running in ten straight, it costs me forty dollars to buy a base plate. Yeah. It's not what it costs to put the plate on my truck. It, and and to me, that's part of what I would see is your vehicle registration gets to be based on the actual cost of registering the vehicle. It has nothing to do with what the vehicle is used yeah. because that isn't what's important. And you just shift it all to the user, right. the user side of it. And if you don't drive, you don't pay. You, drive, you should you work pay. in communications. Uh, <laughs> yes. You explain things very well, yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. I had an interesting thought just occurred to me, and it re it involves the impact of mass transit on this program and on any program that is to generate re revenue for our infrastructure. It seems like it's almost counterintuitive that such a program would then say mass transit is good because if you have mass transit and a number of people certainly writing mass transit because it's good, right. then you're going to have less people driving on a road or getting, uh, you know, paying for their own fuel. Right. So it's, it's really kind of interesting because uh, here in this state, many of us hope that at some point in time we will have mass transit that's sufficiently good enough so that we can use it on a consistent basis and save the roads. Yeah. But, um, I don't know. And the, tra the transit conversation is really interesting <coughs> because um, in our state, state highway funds pay for transportation infrastructure, but they don't pay for transit necessarily. So that's the roads they fund, drive on. But they, they cause wear and tear of the um, infrastructure. So there's, there's got to be a bigger debate about transportation. Transit, yeah. and transit and you know all of those things that impact it but it's it's a start it's an interesting program mm -hmm. um, you know we'll, we'll see how it goes I said it fills the we're, gap we're evaluating the decline now and that's that's what we're really aiming for yes here if the rates and I know that people that use mass transit hate me for that but one of the biggest problems is I look at it from the standpoint of being a commercial operator. Mm -hmm. uh, the prices that you charge to ride the bus, I can't afford to run a bus. And that's part of what's wrong with our transit system, is it doesn't pay for itself. People drive their car and uh, pay, well, like right now, I get, I get 50 cents a mile to to drive my car, reimbursed for bringing myself here, or doing other government driving while I'm going to a meeting, or whatever, I get 50 cents a mile reimbursement for vehicle cost. Well, you take somebody coming from Boise and going to Caldwell and say it's a 30 mile trip, 50 cents a mile is. Um, I'm going to do the 18. Fifteen dollars. <coughs> okay, if, if you if it's it costs if, if you cost if you cost if you charge ten dollars to someone to ride a bus from Caldwell to here, they wouldn't do it. They think nothing of paying that. Because that's a real cost of running that vehicle. And if and if you were change, charging them eight dollars to drive from there, guys like me We'll be putting buses on because we can make money. Because of the number of people way in there were amortized to the point where it became profitable at half the rate that I'm getting reimbursed for driving my own car because it's a realistic cost. Most people don't look at that. They're out there, they jump in their car, they go to the store, 
and it's costing them to own that vehicle, fuel it, insure it. You're exactly right. People they're 50, they're 50 cents a mile is a real number. And, and uh, like you just said, you know, $18 to, to, to ride a bus and call what, what people scream like you kill it <coughs> if you try to charge that. But that's, that's why transportation doesn't ever really get going. Because if there was ever a fee, people really understood where their money's going. Guys like me could buy buses. And we could make a living and have people make a living driving those buses and getting people off yeah. out of their cars. People don't, well, they don't see that. We're hoping that this does sort of help people understand a little bit more well, where I their money is. see where it would. You know, so I always call it, it's the solution to a problem people don't even realize they have. <laughs> well, I see those guys have been in the You know, <laughs> you know. Question? Here and here. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, sir. Are there any uh, plans to look at congestion pricing or? Um, this platform yes. could be used for congestion pricing. That is, that that would be somewhere down in the future. Um, it would probably be once this program became more like a mandatory program, then cities and counties that have congestion issues could use the same technology to, to take care of congestion. So sure. they follow. What does that mean? If I go to so Eagle Road? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah, more to drive on certain roads. <laughs> yeah. Usually during certain times right. of the day only though. So that's right. Um, most states most places do it based on time of day. Mm -hmm. More to drive on that road at that time of day. Yeah. So you got rather than a toll. Almost, yeah. Okay. It could you guys know where they were. Uh, most uh, congestion pricing now is done with gantries, much like tolling, so you cross that barrier and you have an RFID tag on your license plate or something, that's how they tag you for, for congestion pricing now. But it's pretty, it's far down the road. Um, but I have heard it, it's being talked about, of course. Yeah. Well, wasn't your first, the first pilot had to do with, I mean, did you do a talk, at least talk, started out talking about congestion pricing or different rates down in downtown Portland versus um, outside in that borough. That's always been talked about as a possibility, <coughs> but we've never actually done it. But if you did that, you'd open the door to one, knowing where people are, and yeah. two, then you get this Eastern Oregon where nobody lives being subsidized by Western Oregon where everybody lives, mm -hmm. and all the money stays on the west side of the state, and these poor saps well, over here are actually, <laughs> actually, it doesn't because all of the revenues that go to the Highway Trust Fund in Idaho are allocated out to cities and counties. Right, right, and yours are yeah. too, but I'm just saying that if you start getting down, if you open that Pandora's box of knowing where people are, congestion pricing, yeah. That because that I mean, we hear those noises right here in our valley, it's yeah. like the great state of Ada. And it's <laughs> and, and where all the money comes from is not necessarily where it comes back to, but actually you know, our our cities and counties have, have talked about the whole concept of Doni um, counties and donor counties right. and that kind of thing. That's and, dangerous. Uh, during the last session they actually were proposed a transportation package that didn't pass, but some of the uh, counties were actually willing to <coughs> say for that little additional piece of money that might be coming in, they were willing to, to depending on the revenue stream, give some of that to the donee states, realizing that Eastern Oregon has many, many miles of roads that need to be maintained and could not be done with the yeah. formal Yeah, if you've ever driven from Winnemucca to Burns, you probably passed like 20 <laughs> hours total, <laughs> 300 miles, I mean, it's just not Except right. you can't pass them because they drive so slow, you always get to that point where you just can't get around them. That's okay. Amy, did you want to? I was just going to ask you, almost three months into it, and a couple of years worth of planning first, so kind of two questions. One, what do you think was really the best decision that was made, and the other is if you could do it all again, what would you definitely do differently? Wow. I have one. Okay, go. Cool. Okay, my one is um, that maybe not talking about this 5,000 number, because that kind of seemed to be the golden number, whereas it's just a cap. And so maybe phase it, so you start with a thousand people first, like we are, like design it this way. It's kind of worked out this way to start with a thousand. Let them be 
the, your uh, disciples, your ambassadors, and, and talk about the great customer service, and then add up to 5,000, rather than thinking that you know, you've know you only got 1,000. We've actually done quite well in 12 weeks getting 1,000. So that's one thing I would change, sort of the messaging and phasing of it. Um, I think it would be more around education as well. And in part, that's because um, as a field tax administrator, that whole education piece is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> and my, my story that points that out is um, when we increased our tax rate in, in Oregon, it went from 24 cents to 30 cents. And it, I kept telling people, it, it's a fuel tax, not a gas tax. And they'd say, yeah, we're just using gas tax because it's easy. <coughs> and so the bill passed, and we went out to, uh, we changed our forms, we did rulemaking, we did all the stuff that has to be done. And we sent them to people, primarily in uh, Eastern Oregon, and they had the tax rate change. And they'd cross out the 30 cents and they'd write 24, and they said, everything that we read said it was a gas tax increase and it was not going to touch diesel. They assumed that. So having conversations so everybody knows what it is and what it is not mm -hmm. is hugely important. The fact that people, um, early on in the program thought that they were going to have to keep tax receipts, gas tax receipts, and send them in to get the credit. Um, so that still is a question we get. So having more and more education about it first would have been helpful, I think. It's a huge education lift, um, yeah, for sure. And I, I'd like to see it continue so we can test new technologies and, and you know, see, how, see what else can be used in the report. Because as we know, Connected and autonomous vehicles are coming, becoming more and more common. So you have vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication occurring anyway. If you could somehow figure out how to change that into a revenue stream at the same time, that'd be perfect for me yeah. as a tax minister. <laughs> it's probably not perfect for people that are in the political arena. I get that. So. But I guess a question, um, something you can think about down the road is uh, right now you're trying to track the difference. But uh, for that intermediate between the 5,000 and it becomes mandatory for everyone, why not make those who join the program, it's one or the other. If they join the program, they get a card, they swipe at the gas station, and these computers the gas station change the price instantly. Um, and if you, wow. and if you, wow. no, yeah. I mean, that'd I mean, be awesome. I, when I roll into a, yeah. when I roll into a fueling station <laughs> in Oregon with yeah. my semi, yeah. and I've got an empty sticker on the door, I pay for the fuel with the output tax. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and why can't we use that same um, principle in, yeah. to, to part of the phasing in is you go to those that volunteer and say, look, you don't have to travel. Right. Because all we want is. Well, we'll definitely stick around and um, chat with right. you about stuff like that. I'd love to talk to you and, more. And we have, um, we have looked at fuel pump technology, but pump manufacturers are not at the table right now. So, you know, we're, <coughs> we're trying to do this in bite-sized chunks. You know, it's all saying about how do you eat the elephant, you know, one bite at a time. So we're trying to do it one by the time. So well, it's, it's primary example. Whole thing. You've got a card. When you go into the service station, if you've got that card, it takes two, six, ten cents off. The right. Back. You've got yeah. a card that you're a participant in. Yeah. When they read it, it comes up on the pump. Well, it's like when you go your tax off. Pump. You get your Safeway rewards when you put in your number or your Chevron or whatever. You can get a discount based off your grocery that or same print, That same thing it. is already there. You right. go in here with, with, the, with the fuel card, swipe it, you don't pay the gas tax. You should hire you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and we are going to say, we'll stick around. And um, Did you want to ask? Right, no, I, I just wanted to thank you 